Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about hemostasis and coagulation. As surgeons, everything we do is predicated on the ability of the patient to form a stable clot. You only have to be in the OR with one patient with DIC to understand the truth of this statement. In this video, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to start off by reviewing the biology of hemostasis and coagulation. We're going to talk about how this is controlled. We're going to talk about how to assess the adequacy of the hemostatic mechanism. And then we're going to start to talk about some of the problems we might encounter. So we'll talk about congenital hemostatic defects as well as acquired hemostatic defects. And we'll finish up this video with a short discussion on a few hypercoagulable disorders. So let's start off by reviewing the biology or the mechanism of hemostasis and coagulation. The first step in the hemostatic process is vasoconstriction. Blood vessels contain smooth muscle and elastin. So when they're cut, they contract and constrict, helping to control bleeding. This reflex response is augmented by local mediators that may be in the vicinity as well. Some of these mediators include thromboxane, endothelin, serotonin, and bradykinin. The next step in hemostasis is the formation of a platelet plug. Injury to the vessel intima will expose subintimal collagen. Platelets, however, are unable to bind directly to collagen. They require the linkage protein von Willebrand's factor. So von Willebrand's factor binds to collagen, and the platelets then bind to von Willebrand's factor. Platelets contain numerous secretory granules that are able to secrete multiple vasoactive substances. As platelets aggregate, a release reaction occurs, largely under the influence of ATP and serotonin. This release reaction is able to recruit additional platelets to the area. One very important substance that is released is thromboxane. Thromboxane is a very potent vasoconstrictor and platelet aggregator. So it's critical to this whole process. The production of thromboxane is irreversibly inhibited by aspirin. And so we have a situation where activated platelets are able to aggregate. They then acquire the ability to bind fibrinogen. And this is what makes the platelet plug. But this is not yet a stable platelet plug. That will require fibrinogen being converted to fibrin and then cross-linked. And so it goes without saying that if there's no fibrinogen present, there will be no platelet plug. The last step in the hemostatic mechanism is the coagulation cascade. What we have so far is an unstable platelet plug that consists of platelets and fibrinogen. The fibrinogen has to be converted to fibrin to form a stable, firm clot. The conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin takes multiple steps. There's numerous circulating proenzymes that have to be converted in sequence to proteases. All these proenzymes, except von Willebrand's factor, are produced in the liver. And factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are vitamin K dependent. This picture shows an overview of the coagulation cascade. There are two separate pathways, an intrinsic pathway and an extrinsic pathway. And both of these lead into the final common pathway, with the end result being the production of an insoluble fibrin clot. We'll now go over these pathways in a little bit more detail. The extrinsic pathway is so named because it's activated by tissue thromboplastins. 
These are substances that are extrinsic or not normally found in the blood. Tissue thromboplastins are released by damaged cells, and in the presence of calcium, they're able to activate factor seven. The activated factor seven, in turn, can activate factor 10 to its activated form. Since there's only one factor in this pathway, the extrinsic pathway is able to form large amounts of clots very quickly. We monitor the activity of this pathway via the prothrombin time or the INR. Coumadin is a common anticoagulant that is prescribed and it functions by inhibiting this pathway. The intrinsic pathway is so named because it's initiated by substances that are found in the blood. Since there are multiple factors in this pathway, it is a slower pathway as compared to the extrinsic pathway. The process starts when factor 12 binds to exposed subendothelial collagen. This activates factor 12, which in turn activates factor 11, which in turn activates factor 9. Factor 9, in concert with factor 8, calcium and platelet phospholipids, then is able to activate factor 10. We monitor this pathway via the partial thromboplastin time, and heparin and low molecular weight heparins are common anticoagulants that are used to inhibit this pathway. Both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways convert factor 10 to its activated form. The final common pathway consists of activated factor 10 activating thrombin. Thrombin is then able to convert fibrinogen to fibrin on the platelet plug. The final step in forming a stable platelet plug consists of a fibrin cross-linking step, which is catalyzed by factor 13. If necessary, the final common pathway can be monitored by the thrombin time. There are several relatively new class of anticoagulants that directly inhibit the final common pathway. There are direct factor 10 inhibitors and direct thrombin inhibitors. We will talk much more about these drugs in the next video in this series. The ability to form a stable fibrin clot is clearly life-saving to the injured organism. But it's also clear that the coagulation cascade must also be tightly regulated. Too much clotting is also dangerous to the organism. Continued blood flow in the area of the injury is by far the most important control mechanism. It's this continued blood flow that carries away procoagulants and thrombin and all the platelet aggregator products that have been secreted. Intact endothelium in the vicinity of the injury also works to control coagulation. This surface is negatively charged, which repels clotting factors in platelets. The endothelium also synthesizes prostacyclin, which inhibits platelet aggregation as well. There are three well-known circulating anticoagulants. Antithrombin-3 inhibits thrombin, which leads to the decreased production of fibrin. Antithrombin-3 also neutralizes all the procoagulant proteases. Heparin works by greatly increasing the effect of antithrombin-3. Protein C inactivates factors 5 and 8, and this leads to decreased thrombin production. Protein S, in conjunction with protein C, activates plasminogen. Plasminogen ultimately is converted to plasmin, and it's plasmin that helps to break up the fibrin clot. Both 
protein C and protein S are vitamin K dependent factors. The last step in the hemostatic control mechanism is fibrinolysis. Here, plasminogen is converted to plasmin by the actions of thrombin on the fibrin plug. The goal here is for the plasmin to break down fibrin, ultimately to restore patency to the occluded blood vessels. Sometimes, clinically, we can have a situation of hyperfibrinolysis. This can be blocked by epsilon aminocoproic acid or amicar, and we're starting to see the use of tranexamic acid or TXA in the trauma setting. With that brief overview of the mechanics of hemostasis and coagulation, let's now discuss how we can assess the functioning of this system. As surgeons, before we bring a patient to the OR, we need to know with absolute certainty that the patient can form a stable clot. An important part of the surgical history is to sort out whether the patient has any bleeding risk factors. You're definitely going to want to ask about any past operations the patient has had or any major dental extractions they may have undergone, like removal of a wisdom tooth. As far as their past medical history goes, you very specifically want to ask about liver disease and kidney disease, and you're going to want to ask about specific risk factors like alcohol intake or whether there's a history of hepatitis. You're going to want to know if there's any known family history of bleeding disorders. And lastly, of course, it's critically important that you review the patient's medication list. Patients often have relatively little insight into their medical situation, and they may tell you that they're really healthy, but they give you a list of 10 or more prescription medicines. Another thing I've found is that patients often think that if they can get the medicine over the counter, that it isn't really a medicine. So they may not mention it at all. So they may be taking six or eight Motrins a day for chronic back pain. That's something clearly we would wanna know about, and they may not volunteer unless they're specifically asked about it. And the same goes with aspirin. Many patients take over-the-counter supplements. I'm not aware that common ones like ginkgo biloba or ginseng uh, cause any uh, real bleeding problems, but if they are taking some supplement that you've never heard of, it's probably worth looking up. A good detailed surgical history will allow us to assess bleeding risk. A healthy patient with no comorbidities will not require any further testing. However, many of our patients are older and sicker and have multiple comorbidities, and so testing in this population is going to be reasonable. There can be two different types of abnormalities with platelets. There can be a numbers problem, or there can be a functional problem. Thrombocytopenia is the most common abnormality of hemostasis on a general surgery service. But as it turns out, a platelet count greater than 50,000 will be adequate for almost all of our patients. As far as measuring the function of the platelets, there's two tests that can be done. The bleeding time is an older test, and this involved making a small nick on the forearm and then with a tech standing there with a stopwatch, timing how long it took to form a clot. This test has largely been replaced by the platelet function analyzer test. And this gives you the same information uh, non-invasively. The one circumstance where this test is clearly useful is in assessing the degree of platelet function in von Willebrand's disease. There are multiple different 
tests of the coagulation cascade available. Each one of these tests looks at a different aspect of the coagulation cascade. These tests are critically important in patients with known or suspected liver disease or in the many patients who are taking an oral anticoagulant. The prothrombin time assesses the extrinsic system, which consists of factor seven, as well as the final common pathway. It's used to monitor patients who are taking Coumadin. The partial thromboplastin time assesses the intrinsic system as well as the final common pathway. It's primarily used to monitor patients who are taking heparin. Of course, this test would be elevated in patients with one of the hemophilias as well. The thrombin time is much less commonly ordered than the prothrombin time or the partial thromboplastin time. This test specifically measures the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And so it will be elevated in patients on heparin or who are taking one of the direct thrombin inhibitors. Every once in a while, we'll be interested to know the fibrinogen level as well. The most common case for this would be in a patient with disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. There are two common tests available for fibrinolysis. D-dimers are fragments of cross-linked fibrin, and so they're produced by lysis of a fibrin clot. Clinically, we use D-dimers as a marker of clot formation, and so we will see this test elevated in patients who have DIC or in patients who have a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. Fibrin split products will generally be elevated in patients with DIC or who have a generalized hyperfibrinolysis syndrome. The tests we just talked about all look at individual aspects of the clotting mechanism. The thromboelastogram is designed to take a more global or more holistic view of the clotting mechanism. In other words, it's able to assess the system from end to end. So it can assess the function of the platelets. It can assess the function of the coagulation cascade, and it can assess the function of the fibrinolytic system, all in one specific test. This test, I would say, is not widely available. It does require specialized equipment and very trained personnel uh, to make it work correctly. It's not instantaneous, but it's reasonably rapid. It takes about 30 minutes. It seems to have found its most use on cardiac surgery or liver transplant surgery services where hyperfibrinolysis is a particular clinical problem. The thromboelastogram gives us five different values to look at. The first one is the R value, which is shown on the graph here. It's basically the time for the clot to start forming. And so it measures coagulation factor activity. So if this value were prolonged, it's likely that this patient would benefit from FFP. The next value is the K value, which goes from the end of R over to this part of the graph, which represents the time until the clot reaches 20 millimeters. And so this measures the ability of thrombin to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. And so you would see the K value elevated in patients with hypofibrinogenemia. The next value is this alpha angle. And this basically measures the rate of clot formation. And so it's also a measure of fibrin cross-linking. The MA, or maximum amplitude, represents the strength of the final clot. 
80% of the clot strength comes from platelets and 20% from fibrin. The last parameter is this LY30 here. And it measures percent clot lysis at 30 minutes. So it's basically a test of the fibrinolytic phase. As surgeons, we're going to see many patients with bleeding disorders. In the elective or office setting, sometimes we'll make the decision that the risk of bleeding is much worse than the current disease that they have, and we have to learn to say no sometimes. However, in the emergency or trauma setting, this is likely not going to be an option at all. And so one of our big responsibilities is learning how to safely prepare a patient with a bleeding disorder for a necessary procedure. There are patients with congenital bleeding disorders that we will be asked to take care of from time to time. If you practice pediatric surgery, you will probably see more of these patients throughout your career. But even if you limit your practice to adult surgery, these patients are out there and occasionally you'll be asked to intervene. Hemophilia comes in two main types, hemophilia A, which is a factor VIII deficiency, and hemophilia B, which is a factor IX deficiency. This is a disease almost exclusively of males since it's an X-linked recessive problem. The clinical presentation of these patients is directly related to the degree of factor deficiency they have. Because many of these patients do have some factor eight or nine activity. And so spontaneous bleeding is very rare if they have factor activity greater than 5%. But if they have less than 1% factor activity, spontaneous joint bleeding, soft tissue bleeding, and even intracerebral bleeding are pretty common. The disease is initially suspected with a history and an increased PTT, and ultimately it will be confirmed with a factor eight or factor nine assay. The hallmark of preparing a hemophiliac patient for elective surgery is replacement therapy. Now, in a real life situation, this of course will be done with the help and counsel of a hematologist. Fortunately, both factor eight and factor nine are available as a recombinant product, and so no longer do we have to rely on pooled blood bank products. The half-life for these factors is about eight to 12 hours. And so for the patient who needs a major operation, our goal is to obtain a pre-op factor level of about 80% or more of normal. We then wanna maintain that high level for the next three days. Subsequent to that, for the next 10 to 14 days, we wanna keep the factor levels greater than 50%. If the patient just needs a relatively minor procedure, and if they're a mild hemophiliac, then DDAVP is able to cause the release of preformed factor VIII, and that may be all the treatment that these patients need. Von Willebrand's disease is the most common congenital bleeding disorder, and it's transmitted in an autosomal dominant fashion. Clinically, it will present with frequent nose bleeds or gum bleeding, or it may be diagnosed later in the teen years with menorrhagia. The diagnosis is by a von Willebrand factor assay. Patients with mild disease, types one and two, will just require DDAVP before the procedure. Patients with the more severe variant, type three, disease will require von Willebrand containing factor VIII concentrates.
There are two congenital platelet disorders worth discussing. Glansman thrombasthenia is an autosomal recessive disease in which a specific platelet glycoprotein complex 2B slash 3A is missing or dysfunctional. This results in poor platelet aggregation, which clinically results in mucocutaneous bleeding. These patients will have a normal platelet count and the management in the perioperative period will be platelet transfusions as necessary. bernard soulier syndrome is another autosomal recessive disease. In this problem, there's a deficiency in glycoprotein 1B, which is a von Willebrand receptor defect on the platelet. So this prevents platelets from linking up to collagen. Once again, the treatment will be platelet transfusions as necessary. Let's now review some of the more common acquired hemostatic disorders, which are far more common than the congenital problems we just discussed. We've already mentioned that thrombocytopenia is the most common bleeding abnormality in surgical patients. There are many potential etiologies for thrombocytopenia, and a number of them are listed on this slide. In a hospitalized patient, drug interactions, particularly with heparin, are a common etiology. It is considered safe in general surgery to operate on patients with a platelet count greater than 50,000. If we do decide to transfuse a patient with platelets, one unit of platelets will raise the platelet count by 10,000. And so generally we give a six pack of platelets, which would raise the platelet count by 50 to 60,000. We also take care of many patients with impaired platelet function. The number of patients taking antiplatelet drugs has risen dramatically in the past 20 years or so. The combination of aspirin and Plavix irreversibly inhibits platelets and is used to prevent cardiac and vascular stent thrombosis. And so if a patient needs to undergo an elective procedure with a high bleeding risk, these drugs need to be stopped five to seven days before the procedure. If the patient requires an emergency procedure, since there are no reversal agents for these drugs, platelet transfusions may be required, even though the patient will likely have a normal platelet count. Patients with chronic kidney failure also have impaired platelet function. The best strategy for us is to schedule a case the day after dialysis, if at all possible. DDAVP also works well in this patient population to minimize bleeding. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, is a dramatic and highly lethal condition. It's caused by the release of thrombogenic material into the circulation. Clinically, the picture is one of diffuse hemorrhage, but pathologically, the disease is characterized by diffuse microthrombi. There are many different etiologies. In general surgery, sepsis, trauma, and burns would make up the majority of cases. On the obstetric unit, a dead fetus in utero can cause this condition as well. The diagnosis of DIC is generally straightforward. First and foremost, there must be an appropriate clinical setting, such as sepsis. An examination of the lab values will tell us exactly what is going on. The elevated PT and PTT, as well as the decreased platelets and decreased fibrinogen, tell us that all the components of clot formation are being consumed in this diffuse thrombogenic process. The elevated fibrin split products and the elevated D-dimer tell us that clot is being formed. The treatment of DIC is a desperate clinical problem. IV fluids are given at a high rate to prevent capillary occlusion from microthrombi. 
Since all the clotting components are being consumed at a very high rate, blood products must be given. Platelets must be replenished. FFP is used to restore the clotting cascade factors. And cryoprecipitate is used for fibrinogen. Ultimately, however, the treatment of DIC requires dealing with the causative problem. And so a septic source must be controlled. The cold and acidotic trauma patient needs to be resuscitated and warmed up. Over the years, there's been a lot of investigation into using heparin for the treatment of DIC. Initially, this might seem crazy since heparin is an anticoagulant and our patient is diffusely bleeding. However, since pathologically the disease is characterized by microthrombi, it does make some sense that interrupting the coagulation cascade might help the patient. However, in spite of numerous clinical trials, heparin does not seem to work in the treatment of DIC, and so it's no longer used. Hyperfibrinolysis is a bleeding disorder that's caused by the release of plasminogen activators into the circulation. Since the prostate stores urokinase, major prostate operations can result in fibrinolytic syndromes. Cardiopulmonary bypass and liver transplantation are associated with this problem as well. The general treatment is with epsilon aminocoproic acid Amicar, which is an anti-fibrinolytic agent. Patients with advanced cirrhosis are almost always coagulopathic. This is simply because all the clotting factors, except von Willebrand's factor, are made in the liver. Some patients with cirrhosis will also have thrombocytopenia. This is because if the cirrhosis is associated with portal hypertension, the patient may also have splenomegaly with platelet sequestration in the enlarged spleen. If a patient with cirrhosis requires a procedure, then they'll need to be given FFP and cryoprecipitate with a goal of trying to get them their INR less than or equal to 1.5. Now, paradoxically, some liver failure patients are hypercoagulable. This is because the circulating anticoagulants, antithrombin-3, protein C, and protein S, are also made in the liver. And if the production of these anticoagulants is decreased more than the clotting cascade factors, the patients will actually be hypercoagulable. We'll finish up this talk by discussing a few hypercoagulable disorders. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a problem seen in hospitalized patients. It is caused by the production of heparin-associated antiplatelet antibodies. It occurs in up to 5% of patients who've been exposed to heparin and is much, much less common in patients who received a low molecular weight heparin like Lovenox. The timing is that it generally occurs five to 14 days after the heparin exposure. The clinical problem is venous or arterial thromboembolism. The patients rarely have a bleeding problem. The diagnosis is largely clinical and will be suspected if the platelet count drops below 50,000 or decreases by greater than 50%. If necessary, the diagnosis can be confirmed with a heparin PF4 antibody test or a serotonin release assay. The treatment is to discontinue the heparin and start a direct thrombin inhibitor. Antithrombin-3 deficiency is a rare acquired or congenital condition that results in an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. The diagnosis is made relatively straightforwardly 
by documenting decreased antithrombin-3 levels. Perhaps the main point to be made about this condition is that it cannot be treated with heparin, since heparin works by greatly increasing the efficiency of antithrombin-3. And so the management of the VTE in this patient will have to be with one of the direct oral anticoagulants or possibly with Coumadin. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, next uh, week, we'll discuss the uh, perioperative management of anticoagulants.